Please stand. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were as maids of him, so marred by his look beyond human resemblance and his appearance before, beyond that of sons of man, so shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see, those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, one as smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way, but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to a slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and, no, and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living, 
and smit him for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked, and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Psalm is on page 43, Psalm 31. I put my life in your, in your hands, page 43. Father, I put my life in your hands. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears 
to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and the disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to an ass first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that, that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? 
Then Anas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could not they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charges do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If you were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back to the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him up to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And he said to them, Behold, the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, we ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. 
So they took Jesus and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write for the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see if it will be. In order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled, that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that, that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again another passage says, They will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jew Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day. 
for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the first part of my formation as a Jesuit in the novitiate, immediately upon finishing the 30-day retreat, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, I was sent to work with the poor in Kingston, Jamaica. And one of the things I did there uh, was help the missionaries of charity, Mother Teresa's sisters, uh, at a home that they ran for the poor and the dying. One of my daily tasks there uh, was to clean the wounds, the, the leg and foot wounds of several men there that were suffering from and had been suffering long from, from diabetes. And diabetics, if they uh, don't receive good health care, uh, will get uh, chronic ulcers um, on their uh, extremities. And I discovered uh, in these ulcers the meaning of, of the word foul and festering. It was, uh, they were truly disgusting and every day uh, they would become disgusting again. Uh, so I would take off the old bandages and clean and, and uh, clean them and put uh, antibiotics on them and then rewrap them only to do it again the next day. For me this was an experience, a very... Uh, a, a good following upon the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius for it reminded me of one of the meditations from those exercises, a meditation on sin, in which it is suggested that we meditate upon sin as an ulcer. Uh, in the words of the exercises, a source of corruption and contagion from which has issued the most offensive poison. It's really a wonderful image for sin because uh, for a diabetic, these ulcers, if, if left untreated, uh, can truly destroy the body, uh, can lead uh, to amputation and, and even to death. And sin, much like that, if untreated, uh, can and will destroy us. We are all afflicted here by sin. Sin that, if left untreated, will also destroy us. After our Lenten observance, hopefully we are a little more aware of how it is that sin afflicts us. Over the last 40 days, we have sought to turn away from sin and make sacrifices of love to God. But I imagine that it has not been a complete success. And perhaps we have failed both to turn away from sin and to complete those, those acts of, of charity and of love for God and others that we have undertaken to do. In the face of that, we feel our sin perhaps even more strongly in the face of our inability to avoid sin and to practice loving sacrifice. And yet this awareness of our sin and our weakness and the frustration that may come with it is actually a grace, a very beautiful and precious grace that the Lord gives us as a result of our Lenten observances, for it prepares us to receive the good news, the gospel that we celebrate in this sacred triduum that we celebrate especially today in our commemoration of the Lord's passion, that we are healed by the love of the cross. Jesus, through the ultimate sacrifice of love, his love poured out for us on the cross, heals our sins and saves our souls. But to think again of those ulcers. Every day they had to be rebandaged and treated anew. And in fact, some would be healed, but others would never completely heal. But even the ones that would not completely heal with a little treatment, 
with a little love, they could be improved and made so that they would not destroy the whole body. Sin is much the same way. We are often frustrated at our inability to completely overcome it. And we feel as if it may destroy us, but we know that because of the mercy of Christ our healer, Christ our physician, through the power of the blood of the cross, that our sin will not completely destroy us. Perhaps some sin we will overcome. And other sins we will not overcome until we pass out of this life. Just as some of those men's ulcers would not heal during their life. Their ulcers will be healed in the resurrection. I guarantee that their risen bodies will not bear those ulcers. And in the same way, our sin, no matter how deep and festering and foul it may seem to be to us, will be transformed by the power of our Lord's cross and resurrection. And when we too are risen with Christ risen, we will not bear in our bodies or in our souls the marks of those sins. Today we celebrate the heart of our faith, the loving sacrifice of the cross by which we are healed of our sins, that Jesus died for us. And those two words, for us, are the key. They are present in a very, uh, in a very significant way in scripture, in our liturgy, and in our creed, that Christ died for us. In the Nicene Creed that we say at Mass, we hear this for us when we say for our sake he was crucified. It is the message that we hear so magnificently in that first reading from Isaiah, that by his stripes we were healed. It is for us and for our salvation that our Lord suffered the cross. This for us, the sacrifice of our Lord for us is also at the heart of our liturgy. At our great, during our greatest prayer, the Mass, in which the cross is re, the sacrifice of the cross is represented to us, in which we participate in it and receive its power and our grace. We again hear those words for us, but this time in the voice of Jesus himself, in the words of consecration, when he says, this is my body which will be given up for you. This is the chalice of my blood which will be poured out for you. In the words of Jesus for you, this is something that is done for us. The mystery of the cross that we celebrate today is something done for us, each one of us individually. And so how do we respond personally to Christ who has done this, has allowed his body to be broken and his blood to be poured out for us? It does require a personal response. And our Lord has indicated in various ways the response that is pleasing to him. He wants us to love. He wants us to love not ordinarily, but to love as he did, totally, sacrificially, self-forgetfully. He wants us to live the love of the cross in our lives. This is what it means when our Lord says to pick up our cross and follow him, to live that sacrificial love of the cross. At the end of this season of Lent, we perhaps feel the weight of our sins. Not because we were able to get rid of them, but because they stay with us. People often want to know how to overcome this or that sin. And there are many particular answers and helps that we can have, but all of them come back eventually to the only one true medicine for sin. The only thing that can truly heal us the blood of Christ poured out on the cross for us. If we wish to overcome sin in our lives and be healed of them, we grow with Christ in that sacrificial love, of that self-forgetful love of the cross. If we would be saved, we are told by today's liturgy and be by our faith. If we would be saved, 
we must look upon the cross and follow what we see there, Christ's ultimate, perfect, self-sacrificial love. Let us pray, dear beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guide her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, living our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to the nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let, our pray, let us pray for our most holy father, Pope Benedict, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop Michael, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the Church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, Increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our brothers and sisters who believe in Jesus Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom our God spoke first that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way to salvation.
Almighty ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dear friends, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord.
stripes upon his back and to all the crown of thorns upon his head and he bore with every step the scorn of those who cried out for his death
Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may always be free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve us in the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord.